you, Mel. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming out today. Um, but I wanted to let you know that she really would have come here um, if she wasn't very sick. So I hope I do as well as she would have if she was here. Um, Ahmed's case is actually unlike the cases we've heard about so far. There was no entrapment. There was no talk against the government or against its activities abroad. Ahmed was a US citizen studying Islamic studies in Medina University on a scholarship. He was a valedictorian of his class, so he got a full scholarship to study Islamic studies at the University of Medina. A 22-year-old student taking his final exam was arrested by Mabashan officers, the intelligence officers there, basically the equivalent of the FBI, while taking his final exam. He was taken to a prison in Medina and was held there and tortured. His family wasn't even informed of his arrest. And this was back in 2003. Held in, in Medina prison, Ahmed was then transferred to a prison in Riyadh, which is notorious for its torture, Al Ha'ad prison. Just Google Al Ha'ad prison and see what you find. The United States State Department has reports that are issued about different countries and about the conditions that, are, that their prisoners are subjected to, including Saudi Arabia. And if you look at the State Department report about Saudi Arabia, you'll see that it's replete with documentation of human rights abuses. Yet when it came to this case, the US government stood with the, with the Saudi Arabian government and denied any such torture, not just in this case, but generally that Saudi Arabian witnesses were able to stand in front of an American jury via teleconference and say, we do not torture prisoners. And let me tell you how we got to an American courtroom. Ahmed was kept in Saudi Arabia for two years, was tortured there, was made to confess in front of a camera, reading a written confession that was prepared by the Saudi torturer. And if you watch the video, I don't know if it's online, but if you watch the video, there's the subscript. And you can see that at certain points he says, Hamam, basically asking the people who are recording him if what he's doing is what they want him to do. So he read this written confession, and it was in their hands since 2003. But Ahmed stayed in, in the Saudi prison for two more years. No attorney, no contact with his family except as the Saudi jailers would let him. Very limited contact over the phone. No attorney, no charges. He doesn't know what he's being held for. And during that time, his family was scrambling to find out well, who was behind this. Is it the Saudi government? Is it the US government? And the Saudi government insisted to the family that they have nothing against him. They're holding him for two years, but they say we have nothing against him, and we're only doing this at the behest of the United States, United States government. Excuse me. Meanwhile, as the family contacts the US government and sends letters to the White House, they get a letter from the White House wishing them best luck as they deal with the Saudi government. We can't infringe on their sovereignty. They arrested him. They have something against him. Well, the family couldn't believe both governments at once. So they filed suit in the federal court in the District of Columbia and the habeas corpus petition was allowed to proceed. Judge Bates in DC ordered that discovery would continue and instead of compiling, what, I'm sorry, instead of complying, I'm losing my English, instead of complying with the order, um, the US government decided to fly him over. FBI agents who were not involved in Ahmed's arrest or torture were suddenly able to bring him out of the Saudi prison and bring him here to a federal court in Alexandria and charge him with six counts. Six counts, including conspiracy to assassinate President Bush. <laughs> well, what was the evidence that they had against Ahmed? If you look at the evidence that was introduced in court, it was mainly Ahmed's confession, that recorded confession in Saudi authorities' control. That video was not just kept with the Saudis, that video was given to the FBI back in 2003 as discovery would later show. So the FBI had this video of a person saying, I was conspiring with a group of people to kill so-and-so and to do this, and we had the sleeper cells, all this crazy stuff, but the FBI still had no interest in Ahmed. The FBI didn't think he was a threat to the country. They didn't try to bring him or do anything. He just stayed in Saudi Arabia for two years, no charges, nothing. And on top of that, a family friend of the Abu Ali's got an email from the head of the Washington field office of the FBI saying the FBI does not have any interest in Ahmed Abu Ali. And this is after they had the video. 
But when they were stuck because the judge ordered discovery, and they would have to show that they were dealing with the Saudi government to keep Ahmed behind bars in Saudi Arabia, it all came out in court again. They brought him, they brought him to charge him, but discovery showed how they were actually working. It was a proxy detention by the Saudi authorities at the behest of the United States. And if you think that this is something that's out of the movies, go read about this case. And if you think it can't happen to you, look at what the National Defense um, Authorization Act gives the government right now. The power that they have right now is more than the power that they had back when Ahmed was arrested. And this could be anybody today. <clears throat> Ahmed was a US citizen, but his blue passport did not help him when he was in Saudi Arabia. And it didn't help him when he was here in court. Ahmed, when he first was flown, sorry, when he was first was flown and brought before magistrates so that he could be arraigned, he offered to show the judge his back. He said, look at my back, I was tortured. And the judge said, you'll have an opportunity later, this is not the time for it. Sure, we have a system here, we'll follow the procedures. Well, when his lawyers tried to introduce expert testimony from doctors who testify in courts all around the country and are found to be expert witnesses, those same witnesses were not allowed to testify on Ahmed's behalf. They produced reports after examining him showing that he was, he, had, he showed symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, but after two years from the time that he was tortured, the scars were still on his back. So if you can imagine how brutal the torture was. And in pre-trial hearings, Ahmed actually testified and told the court how he was tortured. He was tied to the ground. His two hands were tied, and he was kneeling forward. And a hard object was being used to beat him on his back. When he was finally let go of and allowed to go back to his cell, he touched his back, and his hand was full of blood. That is how brutal the Saudi regime is. And the FBI was not merely being informed of what Ahmed was saying and what the confession included. FBI actually, as discovery later showed, was flying over to Saudi Arabia, attending Ahmed's interrogation through a one-way mirror so that they could see what's happening and he can't see them. And they were even su submitting questions, interrogation questions, suggesting to the Saudi authorities what they should ask Ahmed. So a US citizen studying abroad on a full scholarship, ends up in a Saudi jail, in a dungeon, arrested and tortured without the protection of his own government. And to make things worse, the evidence that was obtained under torture was used to convict him here. A jury was not allowed to see the evidence showing that Ahmed was tortured, was not allowed to see the psychiatrist's reports about his post-traumatic stress disorder, was only able to see the reports from the government's experts saying that it's self-inflicted wounds. Ahmed self-inflicted his scars, basically, were a result of his self-inflicted wounds. So a jury convicted him on all counts. And after the six counts um, were handed out by the grand jury, the government got a superseding indictment with three more counts, including a count saying that Ahmed was conspiring to release some prisoners in Guantanamo. Oh, oh. So, so there were ridiculous charges, unheard of, and I think this case is unprecedented. If you just go back and read more about this case, you will be astonished to see the kinds of things that this government can do, the kinds of things that the Bush administration did to prove that it's succeeding the war on terror. The press conferences that Ashcroft would come out in and say, we prosecuted, successfully prosecuted so and so, and you think, yes, the government is protecting us. Yes, those 9-11 terrorists are being captured and our government is protecting us now, we're less afraid. But these are the stories that you don't get to see in the media. This is actually what's happening. When you hear that somebody's been captured, don't feel any safer, because whoever is actually doing it is still out there. The innocent people are the ones who are being captured. And Ahmed was sentenced to 30 years in prison. Let's go back to his case. He was convicted and he was sentenced to 30 years in prison. And he appealed his case to the Fourth Circuit. The government cross appealed saying that 30 years is not enough. Ahmed needs to get life in prison. The Fourth Circuit decided that yes, Ahmed's conviction should stand, and they reversed his sentence, asking the lower court to give him life in prison. So Ahmed was resentenced to life in prison. And ever since his arrest, even pre-trial, he's been under what's called the SAM measures, or special administrative measures. And they basically seclude Ahmed from the world. He's not allowed to contact anybody other than his immediate family. The books he reads, 
are monitored and screened. He couldn't get Jimmy Carter's book, Peace Not Apartheid, because it contained some dangerous material. He couldn't get President Obama's two books because they were too dangerous for him to read. These are the special administrative measures that the prison system uses. And right now, he's serving his sentence in solitary confinement in the Supermax in Colorado, 20 meters underground, in a seven by 12 cell, all by himself for 23 hours a day, well, in lockdown for 23 hours a day, and then he gets to get out for one hour a day where he gets to exercise on his own. His conditions are so brutal that he went on a hunger strike for a while. It was a long hunger strike that really affected his health till this day. And Ahmed, until today, cannot contact the outside world. Nobody has heard anything from him except for that last sentencing statement that he made during his resentencing to the judge. The judge resentenced him to, to, to life in prison, excuse me, and he's still serving in that same prison, but he has his last chance at justice. Ahmed's case should not be studied as a case in history. Ahmed's case is still going on eight years later. He's filing a petition for habeas corpus. And basically, a petition for habeas corpus asks the court to rule on the lawfulness or the unlawfulness of his detention. And his lawyers are working on his case and should be filing by April, that's their deadline. And right now we're restarting our campaign to help Ahmed's family so that they can pay their lawyers. And I hope that all of you have gained some interest in this case and will go online and read more about it. Go to www.freeahmed.com. That's F-R-E-E-A-H-M-E-D.com. You could also follow him on Twitter. It's Help Bring Ahmed Home. Or on Facebook, join the Google group. I'm sorry, join the Facebook group called Help um, Free Ahmed Campaign colon Help Bring Ahmed Home. Um, we need your help, not just your donations, in raising awareness. Help us pay the lawyers so they can effectively defend him. And tell your friends about this case. If you never heard about this case today, I'm sure that your friends haven't, or before today, I'm sure your friends haven't heard about it yet. So take this and go beyond this room to tell others about it and tell them to help the family so that they can have a chance at justice because Ahmed did not have a chance at justice until today. We have brochures out on the table and we have flyers also with more information. So please pick one up and help the family. Thank you.